All right, thank you. Hello, team. So, welcome to the leadership workshop for project management and execution. But it's not just project management. We will talk about execution, which means all of the team members are stakeholders, participants, leaders at different points in time. And as we go through the presentation, be assured that it will be interactive. So be ready to unmute and speak when needed, okay? Is that an agreement here? All right, see if you hear snorting. Okay, so project management as execution, what is it? So there are multiple definitions. This is one which I liked, so I've shared it. Obviously, there's a lot to cover under project management. So project management is the process of leading the work of a team and also being participant in that to achieve all project goals within the given constraints. So what are the key keywords that we see here, team? So that's the cue for a whole bunch of students to go off of mute, raise their hand, something like that, and throw out some keywords. Yeah, just speak up. There's some in the chat there. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So goals, which is good, leading, process, constrained, project goals. Wonderful. That's really good. So you all have a sharp eye which is awesome. And why is project management and execution so important for us? So before we go there, does anybody know the high level team goals for this year? And if you don't mind, speak it up. So that way we see interaction, unless you have a background noise, which I understand. So go ahead. Does anybody know what are our project goals for 2022? Uh, go ahead, Nikhil. I see you got your hand up. I don't think they're they're finalized uh, for for this year, but I know one that we usually have to qualify for the world championships, and that's something that kind of we retain every year. Sure. And what is uh, the favorite dialogue that we have heard from Mr. Schmidt, uh, Jesse, Mr. John? Begin with the end in mind, right? So begin with the goal in mind. So if that's our goal. How do we work backwards? And my favorite is work backwards, which means the same thing. Keep what you have in mind, keep the goal in mind, okay? So fair. I'll just take a quick example. Say you have a, you have to walk for, oh, sorry, mistake. You have to cover a distance of say, a 0.5 miles and you have five minutes. You don't have a car, so that's a constraint. And you, you don't have something else also as a constraint, which I will not say. But what are the modes in which you can reach your 0.5 miles in about five to seven minutes? What are the ways you go there? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. Keep talking if you have the answers. Just unmute yourself and speak up. How do you reach your target place? to cover say 0.5 miles, half a mile in about five to seven minutes. I, I could skip. Skip, yeah. What? So we could skip, we could walk. So let's be interactive team. If there's no interaction here, it's not gonna work. Okay. Yeah, obviously run, sure. use Safia's running skills. <laughs> yeah, so it's coming to Safia. Uh, if you have to cover, say, two miles in, say, 10 to 12 minutes or 15 minutes, what would you do? You don't have a car. That's a constraint. There's no car that you could use. Bike. Bike, perfect. And if you have to cover, say, 50 miles in an hour, what would you do? And there's no constraint at this point in time. Use a car. Perfect. And if you have to go 800 miles and the actual distance to cover 800 miles is an hour or hour and a half, what would you do? A plane. Take a plane, of course. 
So if the goal is different, the technology used or the way we work is different. So I hope my message is coming across. So if the goal is say achieving, okay, so the going to the worlds is one, but building a good robot as an example, right? A very good robot, competitive robot. So winning and losing is a different thing, right? Those are the results. It depends how we play the game and a lot of other stuff like the strategy. So if covering these distances as an example that we said, and these are all different. So the technologies used or the way we do it is different. So my point I'm trying to make here is based on the goal in mind to build a highly performing robot, what do we need to do? A highly participative team. So being a highly participative team and a high performing team that continues to learn, contribute, and as well as have fun at the same time, right? So we want to have fun while learning and doing all of these activities, but not at the cost of somebody else. So just be positive about that. Like, how do we go about doing that? And let's work still backwards. In order to build a high performing and a high participative team, what do we want to do? We want to participate, we want to maximize the efficiency and also give attention to detail. A lot of time the attention to detail is very important. We have to communicate clearly and transparently. So all these are participative activities from all of the team members, right? It's just not the people who are in important positions. So last point, which is key here, while we focus on the goal, it's kind of repeating the second point. Also focus on the steps and process of achieving the goal, right? So we need to make sure if our goal is, say, as an example, reaching the worlds, we need to really focus on the steps the process, how do we break down things, right? And we'll cover that a bit. So what is key for everybody on the team? I spoke a lot here so far. I'll be a little fast here on this slide. If at any point in time, let's keep it interactive. If you have a question, by all means ask, okay? All right, so we want to be transparent and respectful, self-explanatory. We want to maximize the efficiency, efficiency and productivity, of course. We have to understand that leadership activities and the team dynamics. So if you are working in a team, you really need to understand how to encourage people, how to support the team, right? Uh, there may be people who might not be available at certain points in time. So we need to make sure we are keeping all of that in mind. The most important thing is adapting to change. And we will talk about adapting to change a little further out too, because we will take checkpoints regularly. I'll talk about the plan and everything in a little bit here. And at the same time, we have to overcome the obstacles. So acknowledge the constraints and over, overcome the obstacles. We have to incrementally do improvements where how we have a robot, how do we improve it over a period of time? How do we also be, make improvements to the way we work with each other, right? Those are important. Have measurable goals. So we do have a full interesting session next week on the goals visioning. We will cover a bit of it here, just because I want to drive a few things uh, in terms of what we want to do overall. And one other important thing, like keeping track of the big thing and also keeping track of the small thing. So one of the small things which comes in mind is the focus on measurement and data collection. So at this time, to just stress the important, uh, Mrs. Kama and me are going to play a small script. Hey, Mrs. Kama, did you run the tests on the prototype for the shooter feature last night? Yes, I did. Awesome. Did you remember to record the test data for how fast the shooter was? I looked in our team's folder and I couldn't find it. Yeah, yeah. I ran some tests yesterday and I noted down the measurements. That's awesome. Can I see it, please? Yeah, it's on my phone. Uh, I put it in my notes app last night when I was doing the test. Oh, well, I thought we agreed you were going to make a Google spreadsheet with recorded measurements and put it in our team's folder so that everybody can see it. Yes, um, but this was so much easier. I was running the tests and my phone was right there. So I just recorded the measurements on my phone. Yes, but when you do that, do it that way. No one else knows what the results are and which prototype design should we select for our final submission. Can you please make a structured test results sheet and record all your results in there and put it in the team's folder? Yes, uh, that makes more sense. Um, I will do that now. Thanks for the reminder. 
Great, thank you, I appreciate it. So though this was a script, I just wanted to reiterate how important few small things are while keeping a track of the big thing, right? If you are doing a prototyping activity, you want to get the results high. If you want to be a high performing team, we have to make sure we have the information that we collect very handy so that we are able to achieve our goal of elimination if required for a prototype design, right? So while keeping a track of the big picture, sometimes the small things also are really important. All right, so with that, we have an interesting uh, um, breakout coming up. But before we go there, I just wanted to tell you what we are going to do. So we are going to pick up a robot subcomponent or a feature. I'm just gonna bring up a picture of a robot for you all. And you can, within your breakout team, when you are there, just select one particular feature. And what we want to do is have a measurable goal. So we have a smart goal session coming up next week, but we just picked up a small, the one specific item of that. So here's an example of what is not measurable. Yeah, We want to build a fast car. That's not specific and not measurable. The example of a measurable goal is, as an example of a Tesla car, we want to reach a speed of zero to 60 in five seconds, right? It's pretty measurable across time and what speed. Is that clear? Any questions here, team? All right, so let me bring up a picture of a robot. If you have a robot feature in mind, I just, we just had this uh, picture from last year and think what you, can, what you know about the robot or from your old earlier robot activity too. Let's take a feature and we'll build a measurable goal. Okay, Mr. Schmidt, over to you. All right, so uh, five minutes reasonable. Is that what we want? Yeah, should be. Okay. And so just a reminder to everyone, um, the breakout room countdown timer will go for four minutes, but then you get 60 seconds to wrap up discussion and come back. So you don't need to come back after four, you get that extra minute. Um, go ahead and click on the link that I put in the chat just a moment ago which links to the handouts for this project management section. Uh, section. Um, the prompt is on slide two. The link you need is on slide three. So each room has a link to their own spreadsheet. So based on your room number, you'll click on the appropriate link so you can work independently of, of other groups. Um, all right, here we go. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Uh, does somebody from the team want to read it out? Uh, I can read it out. Um, so my team focused more on the shooter mechanism um, and we were looking at accuracy um, range and like speed of shooting mostly. So our first goal was more of an accuracy one. So the shooter hits the target with a 90% consistency um, from four meters away. Uh, so just so we could get that distance and like we would find out that 90% through trials and stuff. Our second goal, um, I don't remember it exactly, Mr. Schmidt, if you could scroll down. Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> You're totally fine. Um, it was, where did it go? Shooter can shoot the ball 10 meters. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that would be from our max distance would be 10 meters away. And then our third goal was that the shooter can shoot uh, three balls in 10 seconds. Um, so we were just trying to quantify the three things that we wanted our shooter to be able to do. Perfect. Thank you. Any other team? Oh, uh, I can do the turret if you want. Sure, go for it. Uh, can you scroll? Okay, uh, can you scroll up? So I think it's in there, right? Um, about to, is it go under climber. goal one? What? Sorry, Nikki, what did you say? I think we did the climber. Yeah, we did the climber. Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> Should be the third of each response. There we go. Is that one of them? Yes, yeah, it's one of them. So one of our, uh, so we had like a couple of goals. 
So one was that we want to be able to climb onto any part of the triangle that you climb onto. We want to be able to climb on any part of it. Another one was that the robot should weigh less than 140 pounds because that's like the average robot. So we should be able to climb that amount without strain, even without the robot. And then um, I think the last one was to be able to climb in less than three seconds. Do you want the screen back, Jubin? Yeah, thank you. I think we all now get the point, right? That we have to be very specific and have measurable goals, right? And we will not, of course, limit it to three. These are just examples. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, the next one is the high-level build schedule. So I'm just going to share my screen for a minute, and then we'll go to the example. Just a minute, OK? I'll see my screen, correct? Yep. Sorry, my mistake. One second. All right. So do you all see a spreadsheet which says high level build? Season schedule? Anyone? Yeah, we see it. Perfect. So we will use a similar high level schedule. And this is like just a high level plan, not like entrenched as it is, right? We have the ability to pivot and be agile about it. We'll talk about agile in a minute. But just this is giving a big picture to everyone so everybody knows what we are doing when potentially. And if you see certain uh, columns here, I'm just going to read it, read it out. On this column A are the various features or even the overall activities we do. Obviously, say example, game design was something we picked up, right? And we will call these activities that we do over the time scale, which will be week. And in terms of a technical term, we'll call it the sprint, right? So week one, is equal to sprint one, week two equal to sprint two, and that way. So when we start our activities, we'll try to build a high level schedule for the whole season. Obviously we'll do for six weeks at a time. We have to factor in mind a lot of things. Obviously this is from last year. There are certain activities like we do, we, we do like brainstorming, prototyping. We have a new role on the team, which is the integration lead. So we have to think about integration also as an example. So anyway, with that, we'll just uh, get into our next activity. I'm just going to do one quick check. Just give me one minute. It looks like certain slides are skipped. So just a second, I need to fix something. My apologies. Okay, so before we go there, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to explain our robot structure in short, right? On one side, we have the robot captain. We have the various uh, uh, sub teams that we have machining, fabrication, electrical, software, mechanical assembly. And now we also have a new role, which is called the systems integration specialist. Uh, a bit about the structure too. Uh, of matrix structure. We have the robotics captain. I already explained the sub teams here. We have the business captain and then the strategic captain. And the project manager is the glue here. And also we have the features as well as their feature project managers, right? So example, feature one is the drivetrain. Feature two could be the chairman speech. Feature three is the strategy. Feature four, edge placement, right? And at certain points in time, there'll be activities across the sub teams, right? So that's how we have a metric structure, which we are also using for scaling. 
these concepts are really good. They will also help you in your real life at certain points in time. Certain things which you are learning, I have learned in my 15 years of career and you are learning eight years or five years before your career. So this is one good concept to kind of keep that in mind. Okay, so I explained, uh, leaked out the high level schedule that I wanted to talk about. Obviously we have a robot picture here. We went, went to that example and uh, we'll do the activity. So over to you, Mr. Schmidt. So here's what we'll do. You can assume whatever as a feature for the robot you want to build and just come up with a high level build schedule that you think would fit. No answer is right or wrong. It's just to imbibe the activity of working for a schedule, okay? Yeah, Mr. Schmidt, sorry. No, no worries at all. All right, so um, I think everyone still has a link to the handouts. I think I passed along to everyone who's new, so we should be good to go. See everybody back here in five minutes. All right, let's do the hand. Th oh, there we go, there's a the hand. All right, so Raj, what, what room are you in? Uh, we were room five. All right. Okay, so pull that up. Whoa, computers, my computer's really slow. I'm sorry, Raj, I'm slowing you down here. That's fine, no problem. go all right so basically we were talking about the future of chairmans um so we started with the idea of like chairmans is mostly like a business oriented kind of feature so um i guess we were kind of thinking back to like how we did it last year so for week one we usually just um gather statistics and then kind of plan out our short essays um, because like, I remember that's what we started with last year. And then week two was mostly spent on like drafting the short essays. Um, and then week three was, um, having the short essay done and starting the long essays. And then also we periodically meet with the mentors and coaches and get feedback on the short essays and long essays. And then it's basically the same process for the long essays. Um, we try to have that done by the end of week five and then during week five and week six, we also work on our presentation. And then for other sub teams, really what we were thinking is that their only task is to kind of help edit the chairman's essays if they want to, because um, we were thinking that it might be helpful to have um, a perspective of a different sub team's um, viewpoints on our chairman's essays rather than just the chairman's presenters and the coaches. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Do we have time for uh, Nikhil's group as well? Yeah, let's do one more. So we kind of continued on from our, our goals and we continued working on the climber. Um, and we, we kind of went, we started from the front, we started from the end and kind of went backwards just kind of um, to figure out, you know, what, what needs to be done last and how do we get to what we need to do first. So obviously the process will start with um, oh, okay. Obviously the, the process will start with prototyping and end with testing. Um, so we thought about, you know, how it would work in a six week period and we started with prototyping. Um, and it's important to kind of in, in, in a small time frame, like six weeks to be able to kind of start things, um, at the end of some weeks, you know, and, and, and gain progress in the next week. So, um, prototyping and, and some starting some catting some based on those designs, the first week, then finalizing your CAD and sending out parts the second week, um, the machining of parts and starting to, to assemble in your third week. Um, fourth week, we specified our assembly because there's, um, uh, we're trying to find efficiency in that. Um, so the fourth week is to finish assembly. Um, fifth week is then, then to wire uh, and to begin software and, and testing and then Week six is for final testing and then also driver practice with the feature. So this, this is true for any feature, but we specifically did the climber in this case. Sure, perfect. Thank you, everyone. So Alex, uh, in the interest of time, my apologies, we'll have to skip it, is it okay? Yeah.
but when we imagine all of the rows coming all together, we'll have a full plan for the team, right? So each feature team or each team, whether business strategy can develop their plans and then we will have a full fledged plan for the whole team. One of the key things which is going to help us, so moving on is a team availability sheet. So this is the sheet which we have, which will help make sure that we know when team members are planning to come. This is not going to be an attendance sheet. It just helps your team members to be aware when you think you can come. By all means, if you have other uh, commitments like uh, athletics, uh, volleyball, basketball, as an example, any other activity, you are more than welcome to pursue those as well, right? And we will get a reminder from the project manager to fill it towards the end of the week so you can let your team know about your potential availability, availability for the next week. Going a bit uh, in detail about the methodology we follow, which is Agile and Scrum. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about Agile, which in real life is one of the pursued way of working. A lot of companies, big companies, small companies are working in an agile fashion. I'll quickly read the Agile Manifesto, Agile Manifesto, and what are the methodologies that we follow, right? So it's about individuals and interactions, of course, over process and tools. For us, a bit of the process like design reviews, the tools that we use are going to be important, so we'll certainly give it a priority. The methodology, the agile methodology was more prominent for software. Now it's also extended to hardware as well. But it's like the working unit over the comprehensive documentation. The customer collaboration over contract negotiation. We'll talk about negotiation in a bit. And then responding to change over following a plan. So while we'll still have the six week plan as an example, we will respond to change based on what we discover what's important for the team to pivot, right? So what we will do is keep in mind, of course, begin with the end in mind. And we, for us, it's just not about software. It's a culmination of software and hardware and a lot of other things like strategy, business focus. Documentation, as I said, is important in terms of reviews as well. And we will definitely collaborate and negotiate the best strategy. So for example, if something is not working, it's always good to go up to the person who's uh, in charge or who needs certain things. So your goals might be really elaborate. So you remember we did a three second goal. Let's say we can't achieve something in three seconds. It's always good to negotiate the next best strategy. What is the next best thing we can do? Leave breadcrumbs for the person behind, like in the person taking up the activity, as well as think a little bit into the future, how we can optimize or make things efficient and following the high level plan per sprint is key while adapting to new information which we spoke about. So this is specifically about one of the agile methodologies Scrum, which we will follow. It's a lightweight agile process. We talk about the sprints, right? We'll do activities on a repeated cadence which also are called as week one, week two, week three. Now let's talk about specific roles in the Scrum but what we call into our team, right? So the whole team is the Scrum team. The Scrum master is the feature project manager at each and every feature level. And overall, we have the product owner or the strategy lead, right? These are the roles that we have. And as I said, we will split into smaller units so that way we divide and conquer fast. And it's always good to split our work into smaller pieces, which are concrete deliverables, rather than have a big deliverable across six weeks. When we make things smaller, it's easy to bifurcate work, divide and conquer, and do work in parallel, right? So this as an activity kind of shows how we will do incremental work. Uh, this is one more view of how it all comes together. We'll have the daily meetings, which I will cover in the next slide. So remember this slide and the next slide. This is the generic slide how we work in Scrum. So we have the planning, which is called the sprint planning. We do the implementation over the week. We will review quite regularly and we will retrospect and improve. So improvement is constant, right? We, as we learn, we will improve our way of working, we'll improve the robot. Any question here? So remember this picture now and then how we actually practice it into the 
a ski robotics framework. So we already saw the six weeks plan. So thank you everybody for filling that. As we fill the six week plan across the features activities, we will work on the pro product project backlog. This is uh, the tool called Trello, which you're already familiar with. This is Trello. Whatever we plan to do for the week, based on the goals that we have, we will pull the work as a sprint goal. And this is the uh, one story, which is uh, expanded, which is having a magnified view. And then we will have tasks within the story. So each story that we do, we'll have some tasks. As we complete the task, we have to complete check it mark, check mark it, right? And when things get done, we will push it to the done list. We'll have the Saturday sprint review and planning meeting. Uh, so the team leads will explain what has been decided for the week, and that will be covered on the Monday meeting, which I will cover in a minute. And the color coding here denotes, denotes the sub team who is working on that, right? Obviously, this is not very clear in terms of the picture now, but this is how we will potentially work. And we will meet during the standup, during the lunch and dinner meetings, which we will explain what we have accomplished so far, what we plan to do for the activities after the dinner meeting. And if there are any constraints, obstacles, help needed, right? We call it, call it out during the lunch and the dinner meetings. I'm going to move to the next slide, what every day looks like. This generic is in, in the context of Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, what we will do. So Mr. Schmidt, Nikhil, please uh, feel free to cover this, correct this as needed, um, because I've never attended the meetings at 3.30. So we start at 3.30 in room 184 generally, correct? A brief catch up and share the objective of the day, what we are going to do, find the people in the right direction or if they need any help. We talked about the daily stand-up meetings at dinner and lunch, feature project managers, the team leads will share what they've done. Anybody else who needs to speak up, share their updates can definitely do that, right? And the feature project managers will be available to support the team as needed. We won't cover Trello now. This will be covered in December. So this is the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions or else we'll hand it over to Mr. MG for the next presentation. Thank you. Um, so risk management, um, I'll try to get through this as quickly as I can. We've got a lot of material here. So welcome to the risk management section of the Husky Robotics Leadership Workshop. Um, we'll try to answer a few questions about this topic and also introduce a tool to help you manage risks in Husky Robotics. And the, the, uh, there's both uh, the mirror process and then the uh, risk ledger tool. Progress always involves risk. You can't steal second base, keep your foot on first. And risk management is not about operating without risk, but rather about taking prudent risks. You can't realize your potential if you don't take risks. So let's put the why into the context of project management and leadership. Um, so sorry, I'm gonna read through this. <laughs> you can be uncomfortable with uncertainty and still understand and drive to where you need to be, even if you don't know exactly how you're gonna get there. This fosters innovation. Leaders who are best at managing in uncertain worlds also rely on systems thinking that allows them to sort out complex problems. And this is thinking about the big picture when solving problems. Systems level. Embrace the pivot, finding opportunities and uncertainty. Um, see under uncertainty as neither a good nor bad, um, but how will you approach it and how will you react to it? And this is a really important one, I think, for this team. More aggressive goals tend to increase risk and require a higher level of risk management. So if our goal is to make it to the, um, you know, the finals, um, then we're gonna have to keep a very close eye on, on risk. So take prudent risks to maximize positive results. Why risk management? The what includes the why. Risk management is the process maximizing the probability of success by addressing risks. It's not to avoid risk at all costs. Uh, this is the process. Um, proactively manage risks instead of reacting to them. And it reduces chaos in the system. So you wanna maximize the probability and predictability of your success. 
So what are risks? Well, went too fast. Uh, a risk is an event or a condition that if it occurs has a negative effect on project objectives. So risk is always negative. So the effect of realized risk is a more negative project outcome. So there isn't like, oh, there's, there's upside in, this, in the schedule. That's not a positive risk. That's just, you hope that happens. A risk is not guaranteed to occur. So a risk with 100% likelihood is not a risk. That's an issue. And so it needs to be dealt with separately. Um, and one of the first things we do in risk management is identify and quantify the risks. And a common way, common way to manage them is to use a risk ledger. So let's have a look at what one might look like and also explore a good risk statement. So I hope the spreadsheet is in front of us now. So I'm starting out, uh, this risk ledger is kind of busy here. The ones that you will have in your any breakouts will be um, empty in this gray area. It'll just have from rows one through six. Um, we'll start in the missions tab here down at the bottom, which is this whole thing. Um, and the A column is our, our mission. So mission or project or feature, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, based on our definition of risk, we need to know what's at stake um, and what are we are assessing risk for. So that's why you need to know that. Uh, there's a template, template for risk number zero that has a risk statement prompt, this guy, and to the right is its risk type. Okay, and in this tool, there's a there's a pull down to pull off various um, risks that it might be types. Uh, including not a risk. So if you come up with something, you think, oh, this is risk. And when you talk it through, you find out, oh, no, it's not really a risk. Then you can uh, take that and assign it someplace else. All right, so let's look at the identify tab. So what we're trying to do is once we get our mission, we want to identify the risks with a risk statement here. And we want to figure out what type it is, right? So we'll go to the identify tab. So um, Down here at the bottom, uh, you can find that risk statement and definitions for what condition, departure, asset, and consequence are. Um, an event or a, a risk is an event or condition that, if it occurs, has a negative effect on project objectives. So here's the event or condition, the negative effect, and the mission of the project that it does affect. Okay. And we'll get to some examples on this stuff, but I wanted to point out like how to get around in this thing, because when we do the breakout, um, you're going to go into this sheet and, and put in some risks. Okay. And then the, um, the identified types are up here. This is a live table. You'll notice that these match up exactly to the ones in, in, the, um, in the first mission tab here. So when you do this pull down here, uh, these are these risks right here. So if the team finds that there's a particular kind of risk that's not listed here, you can just insert it into it above not a risk. Um, and it'll just show up in the, in the other tab. Um, truthfully, you're gonna end up working pretty much in this area with a little bit of strategic and operational, okay? So technical risks, cost risks, schedule risks, and safeties and hazards. And those are the ones that NASA actually points out. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Oh, which is our breakout. Um, so in your, where do they find these, uh, Mr. Schmidt? So I'm gonna paste it in right now. All right, so there in the chat are the risk management handouts. So go ahead and click on that link before we do the breakout rooms. And that will give links for each room to get to their own dedicated spreadsheet. And so just, um, it's pretty open-ended. Identify three to four risks from your team experience in season or, or not. Um, it could be even, even be from FLL if you want, whatever, whatever. Just if you put the mission down, we'll understand what, what the risk applies to. Um, use the types as a prompt. Um, did you find a risk with another type? Um, and with, watch for the issues, which are issues, issues which are 
risks with 100% certainty. Um, if you find those, mark them as not a risk. Um, and we'll continue with your entries in the next breakout. So you might want to keep that handy. All right. Great. All right, I'll open up the rooms. Again, four minutes on the countdown timer, one minutes to wrap up discussion. And we'll all be back together. Sorry about that. There we go. Very good at muting, my, muting myself. Okay. Um, so I opened up the uh, the rooms here. How many rooms do we have? Uh, six. Okay, let me get rid of a couple of these. Um, are there any rooms I would like to um, point out? Any particular risks? We can pull them up here. You can put it in the chat or just speak. It'll be fine. I actually can't see the chat right now, Mr. Schmidt. And keep an eye on it or just raise your hand like either way there you go Nikhil I saw you unmute you must want to say something there we go uh we were room two okay room and two. we only were able to finish one risk um but we just chose uh as an example we just chose uh chairman's um so we said that given that we want to have multiple outreach events there's a possibility of not having enough members uh or or members who would who want to lead those events um, this adversely impacts our ability to be successful and in, in, to successfully run these events, thereby leading to, to not have a significant impact our community and impacting our chairman's presentation. That was well written. That's a good risk statement. Um, and it's operational. Almost looks like operator there. Um, any others before we move on? Uh, Connor? Yep. Uh, I was in room six. Six, okay. Uh, so I think one of our main risks was not having enough time to complete all the projects and designs we want to. So having like time as that constraint. Okay. Um, no, we said that was sort of like a. This this one is um, um, there are schedule risks, um, but just not having enough time uh, really points to a project management planning problem and that um, per perhaps we uh, we don't have enough people or we didn't plan out the tasks properly or break them down into the weeks pro properly. Um, and so sometimes um, what sounds like a risk is really poor execution. I hate to say it that way. But if you do better project management, then you solve these problems. This is an issue, right? This is a scheduling issue. Um, where a risk is actually something that you're not really sure if it's going to happen and not having enough time to complete something. Once you have a workable plan, um, this might actually be a risk for a particular um, piece of the pie, right? Like um, if you had said, we might not have enough time to practice if we don't get our designs, if our, we don't get our robot built in time and if it's not reliable enough. And so then those are things that you can go after in trying to solve those particular problems to move it back. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, that's good. Yeah, actually feature creep is, um, I'll point out the next one here is really good. Feature creep is a common risk problem that you, you risk getting the features that you decided you were gonna do by adding something without properly planning it through, right? So a lot of times project management will keep you from introducing risks if you're thinking about risks. And that's the purpose of this is to put a process in place that you can think about the risks. Um, we started a little late, so I think we'll just move on. Um, um, okay. So we just identified some risks and their types, but how exactly do we address them? So this is um, Sean Van Drill um, put together a lot of this presentation for last year and a lot of this material uh, came from that. So thank you, Sean, even though you're not here to hear the thank you. Um, and he came up with this MIRA, M-I-R-A, Mission Identity Identify Ranking and Actions. And you've heard me using this, these terms mission and 
identify. Um, and basically, it's like, how do you break down the risk management um, process into something that you go, okay, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, right? Um, and I like Mira in Spanish, Spanish to English translation, it's um, sight, aim, intention, look, watch, or see. Um, and the aim is more like aiming a gun. Where, where do you want, want to end up? And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice little acronym. Okay. So we'll just go through these really quickly. Mission can also be thought of um, as goals or requirements. What are we trying to accomplish and what's at risk? Um, this can be at different levels of our project, top level design, a feature, a functional group. Um, we saw missions in our ledger so we can track the effects of different risks to our project. So if you have a particular feature and that feature is the mission or mission slash project, then that feature manager can go and sort by his risks and the worst ones, et cetera, and know what he really needs to deal with. Then every risk item needs to be clearly identified identify the specific uncertainty that gives rise to the risk and a type which helps drive um, in, hmm, my notes are bad help uh, gauge consequence. So um, as you saw in the example risk statements are specific and associated with the mission and have a type. So once you have a risk statement, you have a type, um, then what? So we'd like to rank these risks. So um, if we go back to the sample risk ledger and discuss the um, NASA risk matrix, grab that thing again. I need more screens. Okay, I'll go back to the mission tab. Um, and let's remind ourselves of what we did last, last time. So the risk statement, again, this is a uh, prompt. Line six is really just a prompt here um, to help us write a good risk statement, all right? Um, and then the risk numbers on the left um, help us to track which risks we're, we're talking about because you're gonna end up sorting these things by mission and by priority and things like that. Um, but we'd like to figure out what is the priority of each risk. Um, so we want to assign a likelihood and a consequence to each one and from that come up with a priority score, um, good or bad or somewhere in between. So if we go to the ranking tab down here, we've got the likelihood on the vertical, we've got the consequence, it could also be called impact, likelihood could be called probability. And so you wanna assign some number to that. And so from this table, you go, okay, well, if it's 50% probable, I'll put a three in there, right? And then for consequence, this is why we wanted to know what kind of type we had. Because for the general types, you can come in here and go, oh, I had a, um, a schedule issue, right? And so you can see it talks about critical path and how much of a slip. And so you can kind of gauge like where that thing lives on this continuum here. Um, so let's say that um, uh, very high likelihood, but the consequences is almost nothing, right? Like a schedule, minimal consequence you may not care about that risk. And you may decide that, well, we'll just accept what happens. But if you get one up here to 22, where um, the probability is very high that it's gonna happen, upwards, it could hit almost 80% on that one. And then the impact is like for technical or performance, unable to achieve multiple objectives, goals, goals, or object, goals and objectives, but minimum success can still be achieved. So sure, you still have a robot and it can do some stuff, but minimum success, take it to the limit, that's a rolling rectangle. So you don't wanna be in the red if you can help it. So uh, the way to rank your risk is you go in and, oh, it's a technical risk. You go, okay, what's the probability? That's pretty easy for everybody to think of. And then uh, what's the consequence? You can go pick your type over in the, uh, the ranking tab um, and kind of figure it out. Don't worry about it, pick something that's close. Um, and from that, it will look up what the ranking number is. It's because it's not just multiplying or anything, it's NASA um, and it color codes it for you. So you'll also see in um, different websites, some of them have four col or five colors, right? There's a light green, there's, a, there's an orange in there, but we're just sticking with three for now. If the team decides they wanna add more later, that's easy to do, 
Okay. So for these three risks that we have here, um, we would certainly want to work on this one first, right? Um, so if we read this one out, um, it's about global supply chain and its impact on getting material. Um, and will we be able to build our robot, right? Uh, but we don't know exactly what the risk exposure is, um, but it could be pretty bad, right? So this is something that we'll want to deal with and we'll, we'll want to have some sort of an action for, okay? So that's the ranking. Okay. So the next breakout, uh, you guys try it. So we'll continue with the sample ledgers um, from the pre pre previous breakout. And go ahead and for your risks, um, give them a likelihood and a consequence, put it in the ledger. Um, and see what the priority turns out to be. Um, and double check the priority, go and take those numbers over to the risk matrix, go, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then we'll continue with your entries in the next breakout. And just to confirm, Mr. MG, three minutes total here? Yeah, I think that this will be a quick one, yeah. Okay, so two minutes on the countdown timer, a minute to wrap it up, here we go. Thanks. All right. There we go. Um, raise hands to um, if your team would like to report out what uh, made it challenging to specify the likelihood and the consequence. All right, go ahead, Alex. All right, we were grouped. Did you want me to share it out on my screen? Sure. Let me see that. Um, there we go. I think you guys can see it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, so um, we had four, or I guess three technically um, um, features or like the risks that we had. And then the first one was high versus low goal and the risks of it. And then we thought it was about like a four. Um, we thought it was about a three and a half, but it leaned towards four. We didn't put it as a five because it doesn't affect other features. So even if the low goal or high goal like doesn't work, we still have other features that work. Um, for the drive train, um, we, we said two for both of them, which is risk number two and number four. And that's because we think the likelihood of it happening is low, but if it does happen, the consequence is higher. And then our cookies versus brownies one <laughs> was more of a funny thing from FLO. We just thought about the likelihood of happening is not too high, but the consequence is very high. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we'll ignore the cookies versus brownies for this because um, <laughs> you're beyond FLO. So for the other three, um, which do you think you would start working on first? Um, I would say drivetrain because drivetrain like leads to, drivetrain is like the basis of the actual robot. And it has two of its own risks within its, within its own feature. Yeah, and you happen to give them both the same rankings both for likelihood and consequence. So those two, you would either work on, on both of them or you know delve deeper and find out which one's really more uh, a higher priority. Um, yeah. So would high versus low goal be in the same um, team as drivetrain? As in like ranking of risk wise or? Right, right. Well, so we'll go ahead. I would say no. Okay. Just because so, we can. Yeah. yeah. I know like the numbers don't line up, but it's because we were like debating between a four and a three. Oh, that's that's fine. It's totally fine. Yeah. Um, it's more of, so we can have some discussion about it. Then is the number exactly perfect, right? Yeah. Um, did uh, let's have one other team report out. Is there another hand up, or should we move on? Um, it is 920. Oh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> Take <Thanks>. off. <laughs> okay. Here we go. I'll try to go fast. My brain doesn't work that quickly this late at night. <laughs> okay. So, um, what actions will we take to address these risks? 
Uh, depends on the risk priority and communication is the key because hard choices may be necessary. Um, so let's grab it, this again. Let's go to the actions tab this time. Um, and so, wait a second. Okay, yeah. So here we've uh, highlighted uh, types of actions and they're listed in priority. So we would rather um, eliminate a risk. So the limit is reduce or eliminate either the likelihood or the consequence, then accept the risk, which is basically we're not going to do anything about it except for kind of keep an eye on it on it in case it happens. Um, uh, the limit approach moves the risk towards the green. Um, and if we take the hatch alignment mechanism from our earlier sessions, uh, the saloon door hinge, this was a make versus buy solution. So the schedule risk was completely eliminated on that one. Um, for contingency plans, um, for example, we have a substantial risk in supply chain. What can we do as a fallback if we can't get our primary raw material? Should we buy more and carry stock to next year? That has a cost and budget consequence. It might impact our ability to buy the rest of the parts. This is a case of needing to manage the risk rather than spend more than we can afford. Um, avoidance, um, an example of that is the year before we ran our first swerve drive in competition, we implemented on a test robot. Um, we decided not to design it and run it in the, in the same year. Um, in our first year of competition, which is the year after it was developed, we only implemented robot relative moves, which doesn't mean much to most people, but um, the following year we added field relative, which is more complicated and really cool. Um, but we decided not to do that all in one shock. So it really took us um, three seasons to get to where we wanted to be but we didn't add undue risk to the entire season by trying to bite off everything at one time. And then acceptance is if the risk is associated with a nice to have rather than a must have feature. So the consequence is not that high, then the risk might be worth taking. Um, so I don't know, maybe there's some feature that allows you to speed up something. Um, and if it doesn't get done, you're still able to do it, but maybe not quite as quickly. So. Uh, that might be an accept type mitigation. The overall action is based on the risk level. Um, it's one of the reasons we rank. Um, the lowest risks may simply be monitored. The medium risks and above require active management and the highest risks need high visibility, more active management and more aggressive mitigation. And that's the one where everybody needs to be aware of those types of risks. Um, often a risk action requires kind of coming up with a plan to address it. So the risk planning phases um, are also listed. Those are down here. Um, and I'm not gonna go into those because I think we'll run out of time. Um, some of those activities are individual, some are as a team as appropriate, but generally the plan and alternatives are reviewed and approved. Um, so we've, been com we've come up with these risks. We want to um, uh, come up with a plan. Sometimes you need somebody to go off and evaluate what the plans are gonna be. So that's the, the risk planning phases. Um, all right, so let's go back to mission. So once a risk is identified, a plan may be in order and the planning is a separate activity than the execution, execution of the plan. Um, and our ledger has columns for the latest status, who's driving closure, the plan of action, and the current risk. So I was uh, remiss in not pointing out that we actually have two sets of um, scores here. This is the initial score when you first come up with writing your risk statement and you, um, uh, you know, assign a risk to it. When you come up with an action plan and you start tracking it, over time, your current priority, you hope, is dropping, right? Until finally you get to a point to where um, this can be moved to the closed pile down here. So you move your risks out of the way and um, um, you've successfully mitigated a risk. So that's what all of this stuff over, over on the right is here. So if, you're, if you have reds and yellows and some of the greens, you're gonna come up with some sort of a plan and then decide um, what you're gonna do about it. And, um, so you can see over here, we've got owners, we've got Maggie and Bart and Lisa, 
and uh, you know, when was the when was the risk identified? When was it closed? If it was closed, this particular one was not a risk, um, but it even though it wasn't a risk, it was an issue, and so then we move this from the risk ledger over to some pro project management um, item that on a Trello card to be tracked, right? This particular one was we were going to run out of stock in this hypothetical situation. Andy marks out of stock. We can't buy it in our usual channels. What do we do? And then in the process of, of analyzing this risk, we realized, oh, well, maybe that, that's a problem in the electrical or maybe that's a problem somewhere else. So maybe we should go and look through um, if we have outstanding risks somewhere else in our supply chain, for example. All right. Um, so let's uh, break out one more. Do we have enough time for we don't? All right. Um, so what we were going to do was continue with the sample ledgers um, and for each, each risk, fill out an action plan, which is all hypothetical anyway. Um, so it's not uh, critical that we go through that here. So are you OK with skipping that, Mr. Schmidt? Uh, sure. No, I think I'll, yeah, you're right. It worked out fine. All right. Um, so when do you apply risk management? So we, we've got this big, what seems like a very complicated process. Um, um, but it's, it's not something that you're doing all the time necessarily. So initial project planning, comparing kickoff solutions, selecting among multiple possible solutions of architecture, concept designs, prototypes, an exercise in strategic gameplay, what might break our strategy on, on the field? Um, one-way versus two-way door decisions, how risky is the one-way path? Um, and the, um, well, I thought I had some notes here on that, but a one-way decision, a one-way door is one that you go through the door, but you can't go back out the door. A two-way door, you can go in, check it out and leave. And so a one-way decision, a one-way door decision, um, is really hard to back out of. So you have to make sure that you know what the risks are when you take that type of a choice, right? So it's not that you don't do it, but how risky is it? Oh, it's not risky, go for it. So um, MIR mission, uh, identify and rank, primarily early stages. The actions are ongoing in the weekly project management activities. So the cl closing points, uh, is do take prudent risks so you can maximize your potential. Um, you need, you can't go without taking risks. But move from reacting to proactively managing risks. It takes about the same amount of time, but you get better results. Um, keep the process generally lightweight. I know that this is a big spreadsheet and there's a lot of like going back and forth between tabs and such. But once you get the hang of it, I just wanted to get everything in one place. You're really working on the ledger and follow the prompts, go for reference to see how to fill out the numbers. Um, uh, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And your decision quality is greatly improved when you quantify your risks and include that information in those decisions. And that I think is it. Thank you very much. I had one minute left. All right. Amazing. <laughs> Well, huge thank you to Jubin and Ms. Kama and Mr. MG for sharing their expertise with us this evening. Um, this was this is our fourth in our series, um, and as mentioned, we'll be back next week with um, vision and goals for our fifth and final workshop. Um, so we hope you can all join in join us next Monday for that. Um, but uh, thanks again to our our mentors. This is wonderful. And I hope everyone has a, a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.